All right, hello, um, I'm Joe. Super happy to be here. Uh, very lofty title, so I hope that I don't disappoint. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, I most recently worked at Microsoft. Uh, I was in charge of the languages and compilers and IDE and taking .NET open source and, and cross-platform and all those sorts of things. I was actually there for uh, 12 years. A significant amount of the time was actually working on safe system software. Uh, not to cut to the chase too much, but to cut to the chase, you probably uh, haven't seen much about it because we actually didn't ship it, and so that's actually part of the story. Um, so I left Microsoft in uh, September uh, to do a startup. So I'm currently CEO of Pulumi in Seattle, and uh, we're a cloud startup. Uh, currently in stealth mode, but hoping to change that uh, pretty soon. So I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm hope hoping the story doesn't depress you too much. Uh, the goal is to learn from the story. Uh, I sort of went through this uh, and emerged stronger than before, and I'm hoping that I can share some of the key lessons and then talk a little bit about why I think some of what everybody in this room is doing and some, some of what we were doing really tells us where the future of computing is going, in particular for system software. Uh, and that's a pretty broad topic, uh, pretty broad scope uh, system software, but I'll try to break that down a little bit as well. And so first, the story. Um, so myself, my background, uh, when I was at Microsoft, basically throughout the entire 2000s, I was in charge of sort of threading, concurrency, primitives for, for .NET, some of C++. Um, so as soon as, you know, the, the Moore's Law is over, sort of uh, panic set in. You know, we were working closely with Intel to come up with new technologies to solve that in software. So that included um, pretty basic things like introducing thread pools and better ways of introducing concurrency, uh, better synchronization primitives, pretty basic stuff that people take for granted these days. Uh, some exotic things like software transactional memory. Uh, so we actually had a version of the CLR with uh, STM built into it. Turns out, you know, that never shipped, but something like uh, eight, nine, ten years left after that, um, uh, speculative lock elision in processors and some of the HLE uh, instructions started showing up. Um, and maybe most lasting uh, during that era was coming up with task parallelism and better data parallelism primitives that today are sort of the underpinning of async and await as you see them in C-sharp. And so back then we were working with you know, the F-sharp team who was really the, one of the earliest pioneers of doing async await uh, and trying to get those ideas into C-sharp and that eventually uh, panned out. But notably absent during this period was anything about safety. Um, there's a little bit of message passing, so you could say that was absent as well, but really the biggest thing was safety. We, we tried with software transactional memory, but it turns out that was the wrong solution to the wrong problem. Uh, but the whole beauty of STM was you could slap an atomic block around a big honking piece of code and not worry about what it does. It turns out that doesn't work in practice because you end up with lock contention in places that are completely bizarre that you didn't expect. And so it turns out taking a step back and thinking about safety in an entirely different way was a better path forward. Uh, and it's not that STM is bad, it, you know, it's definitely got its place, but the fundamental architectural principles of isolation and safety were far more important. And we sort of missed the point uh, back then. And partially it was because we were, we were dealing with constraints. We were trying to wedge this into existing systems like, you know, Windows. <laughs> The Windows theme will recur. <laughs> <laughs> so around the same time, obviously, you know, this is a pretty abysmal situation. It really hasn't gotten better over the years. In fact, it's gotten kind of worse. You know, every week you see the top of Hacker News is like, oh, some new buffer overrun and some new exploit, some remote uh, code execution in some critical piece of software that literally the world depends on. It's, it, it is kind of ridiculous that we're in 2017 and the situation has not gotten much better. Thankfully, you know, we're all kind of jointly working on a solution to that. Uh, but this was back then, even back then, we were looking at, hey, security in Windows is really terrible, and it's a really bad PR thing, and, and this is back around the trustworthy computing initiatives, if you remember that, you know, Bill Gates is one of his top priorities, and so this is top of mind as well. And so you add those together, and we're kind of like, hey, we're screwed, what do we do? <laughs> you know, Windows had this antiquated threading model that didn't scale. Any of you that know COM, single-threaded apartments, uh, you know, thread affinity, there's so, so many kind of deeply rooted problems in the architecture um, that we were really running into a wall when multi-core arrived. And of course, the growing security threat 
you know, what if it accelerated even further and this lack of safety at the very fundamental heart of the system became a critical and fundamental weakness? What would we do? We really didn't have an answer. And furthermore, this is more of a Windows sort of trivia thing, but I don't know, um, there's like a hallway of the architecture of Windows and the dependency diagram, and it looks like somebody smeared spaghetti across like a 20-foot wall. <laughs> and that really inhibits the ability to innovate, and, and you know, if you don't have componentization, you don't have separation of concerns, you can't have separate authors for these components. And so we looked at this, and you know, there are many promising alternatives. Uh, furthermore, you know, Kikos, Eros, Kyotos, these sort of more secure capability-based operating systems had been around for a long time. We had been working on safe, at least type and memory safe languages in you know, sort of the .NET space. The, I don't know if people remember the Windows Vista experiment, but you know, cramming C Sharp into the heart of the operating system without anything more than just that, uh, turns out it's not a good approach. Um, but at least we had some experience with what that looked like. And so that's when we came up with the idea, this is probably somewhere around 2006, 2000, late 2006, uh, to start an effort to build a new safe operating system from the ground up. And so this was literally reuse no code um, to start. And architect it the right way. Don't focus on you know, um, compatibility. That's the big thing. I don't know if folks realize how big at Microsoft compatibility was. You know, a breaking change was just forbidden completely, even if uh, the only way that it was allowed was it was a security fix. Uh, but people really took compatibility very seriously. And so we were saying, hey, no, it's Greenfield. We're going to start from scratch, and we'll see where it takes us. And really, this is an insurance policy. We didn't go in thinking we're actually going to replace Windows. We thought, hey, um, worst case, we could take some of the ideas and apply them to Windows. Um, best case, we don't actually need it because it's an insurance policy. And so we focused on these core concepts, isolation. Uh, and so singularity, we, we actually took some of the singularity ideas to start with. This is a project that came out of Microsoft Research that used software isolation for um, safety. So it was actually building on the fact that it had type and memory safety at its core to actually have lightweight isolation. And this is what's necessary, especially compared to Windows, where the, the process model is so terribly heavyweight. Um, I think you know, Windows Thread <coughs> is roughly the cost of a Unix or a Linux process. And so you know, Windows process is just enormously heavyweight. Uh, and that discourages some of the message passing and sort of important architectures that we saw. Capability-based security, both in the application model and the programming model. So we actually used the fact that we had type and memory safety to actually embed capabilities into the programming model such that you know, an object reference really is an unforgeable uh, token. And so we actually used object references as essentially capabilities. Um, similarly, there is no ambient authority, so there's no mutable statics, no thread local storage, et cetera. Error model. Um, you know, comparing to Win32 with return codes and some exceptions, but mostly return codes. And, you know, C Sharp that had implicit, any API can throw, you know, had no idea what it is. Uh, in fact, there's something called asynchronous exceptions. So the, the garbage collector can come in and like suspend your thread and inject an exception between arbitrary instructions. And so it's not even possible to know where all the errors can come from, which I know that sounds ridiculous. It is. <laughs> um, and so we said, no, 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 all errors are going to be explicit, and we will bet on fail fast in a big way. So not just fail fast for you know, unhandled errors, but fail fast for unexpected conditions like arithmetic uh, overflow, uh, even out of memory. And so what we ended up with was essentially three safeties sort of working in harmony. Memory safety, type safety, and concurrency safety for all code with the exception of essentially some very low-level, you know, microkernel stuff that interface with the hardware, um, but 99% of the system was type memory and concurrency safe code. So that was sort of the system architecture, and so we got to, you know, writing lots of code, and it turns out, you know, we started using static analysis. We started from C-sharp. Why did we start from C-sharp? Well, we were at Microsoft, so <laughs> that's one reason. Um, and so, you know, C Sharp's a, a great language. It's very, you know, productive, but it definitely has some problems, uh, like the fact that 
exceptions can permeate, you know, or emanate from any instruction. Um, there are other problems too. It's garbage collected. Uh, there's no way to do stack allocation. There's no notion of lifetime safety. There's no notion of concurrency safety. Uh, and so we essentially took C sharp and we started uh, changing it. And the goal was really to, you know, th this is sort of a false uh, bifurcation of the space, but to rough approximation, you know, you tend to have, you know, performance and safety and productivity, and they're often at, at you know, odds with one another. <clears throat> um, and so we were looking for the sweet spot where it was a safe and productive language while also being performant. And what we did is we sort of went and looked, you know, I, I was familiar with a lot of the uh, research in, you know, sort of uh, advanced type systems. I'm a big Haskell fan. Uh, so we went and basically dug around, you know, I was aware of, you know, Cyclone and all these, you know, region-based uh, systems in the past and borrowing and effect types. And we sort of took all those things and threw them into a blender along with C-sharp and said, okay, what, what actually comes out? And it turns out what came out was something that was really a good blend of some of the productivity you have in C-sharp and the performance we needed and the safety we needed. And it turns out, you know, this, this was all happening 2007, 2008, somewhere around that time frame. And it's funny because it's around the, the time frame that, you know, some of the Rust concepts started coming out. And so I remember, you know, we would compare notes with some of the early Rust, you know, folks and some early Go folks and uh, folks in the research community. And we ended up in a semi-similar place. We even used ampersands for borrowing. <laughs> Um, and then this happened. Uh, and so, you know, we, we, we had some wins, and I'll talk about some of those wins later. We were actually running this in production. So we were running the Microsoft speech server on this, you know, so anytime you spoke into your Windows phone, which I'm sure a lot of people did, um, <laughs> you would actually hit Midori on the back end, uh, and we'd be serving up requests. And that, that was massively parallel because it used deep neural networks, and, and it was using all safe parallelism, and it replaced the existing one million lines of code C++ system that, that had existed uh, beforehand. So better performance, safety, better productivity. I mean, it was great. And it turns out we were trying to figure out, okay, so this experiment seems to be going well. What are we going to do next? And so things like this started happening. You know, the government actually came out and said, hey, you shouldn't be using Internet Explorer because it's just not safe. It turns out a lot of these bugs in Internet Explorer were used after free bugs. Basically, what would happen is you'd be on a thread, you'd call out to some user code, you'd run the JavaScript, it would call back into the, the, the engine, and the engine would re-enter into some piece of code that wasn't expecting to be re-entered, it would release some critical resource, and then you'd unwind the code, and the memory would be freed, and game over. Uh, and this happened all the time in Internet Explorer. And it's partially the way they wrote the code, but it's partially, you know, just a hard problem. This is a huge C in C++ code base. I should mention, just uh, as an aside, even though Windows and a lot of its components are C++, it's really C with classes. And so it's not very modern C. And so as we talk about some of the future improvements, that's something to keep in mind. So, we went to Windows. Uh, so we actually moved the project into the Windows team and said, okay, how, how do we actually make this thing happen? Um, it turns out we bit off a lot there, and we'll see the outcome wasn't, wasn't awful, but I think this starts to talk to some of the challenges that we have with sy safe systems programming in particular. <clears throat> Essentially, what we found was there are a lot of guys who have been and gals who have been programming C for the last, you know, 30 years, and not only were unwilling to, uh, to adopt some of the C++ uh, things that would make their lives easier, like smart pointers and everything, and never mind some new fancy language that had this type and memory safety stuff, like why do we need that, right? Uh, we seem to be doing well without all those fancy things. Um, see, see previous slide with use after free bugs. Um, but that really is, when you look at some of the hairiest code bases on the planet that really need this stuff, it is human, human challenges that are going to get in the way. Like, has anybody talked to Linus uh, about whether he wants to replace parts of the Linux kernel with Rust? 
good luck. <laughs> and yet, that's where we need to go. So the outcome of this, um, so I'll save you the, the gory details of what it looked like in the end, but essentially we ended up with lots of learning, unfortunately not shared broadly, uh, which is shame on us. We should have been writing research papers the whole time. If the project started in Microsoft of today, it would have been open source. Um, that's a sort of a big change uh, since when I was, when I was there, um, or towards the end of my tenure there. We did end up with some improvements to C-sharp. So we basically said, okay, let's take this, all the sets of things that we needed to change in .NET and C-sharp and make, you know, bring those back to C-sharp so that it could be used for more systems-y things. Uh, it turns out, you know, we've got some nice performance wins. Um, slices are coming out, which is basically the ability to take a subsection of an array without actually having to copy and, and allocate. Uh, it's something that should have been there from day one, but wasn't. Uh, many of them still in the works. Uh, we also launched a bunch of efforts to try to improve the state of affairs in C++. Uh, you probably hate me for that. Uh, I kind of, I have trouble sleeping with myself at night sometimes as well. Um, but some good things came out of it. Um, like, you know, better ways of writing C++, better tooling to enforce some of the, the safety things. You know, really with modern C++, you can stick to a safer subset um, with smart pointers. And the team tried to define, you know, sort of a borrowing-like thing that would work with um, C++ references and smart pointers. Um, some improvements in Windows, not as much as we had envisioned, um, but it turns out all this happened around the same time that um, you know, the, the government was coming out saying don't use IE, and so that, that's actually what birthed this Edge browser, which was this new rebranded thing, but a lot of the core tech actually made its way into that as well uh, with some associated safety wins, so you didn't have these use after free uh, issues running rampant. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the key lessons from, from this overall experience. And like I said, I hope not to be depressing, so let's get on to the inspiration and innovation part. So what, what worked? Well, surprisingly, safety everywhere worked. I, I thought that was the biggest bold bet that we were making. I thought there was no chance it would work. You know, the idea of writing an entire operating system uh, with safe code just seemed crazy at the time. Uh, everybody else told us we were crazy. Um, what was particularly interesting is um, that you could actually have data parallelism because we had data race free ways of introducing parallelism. This is nothing new to folks you know, using Rust, but at the time this was pretty novel. Um, and there were productivity uh, wins as a result of that, you know, just not having to worry about all the classical you know, buffer overruns and, and standard things that just kill productivity and suck your time dry, you know, debugging, just were not present by construction. We had this phrase, you know, correct by construction, uh, which was a little bit of a lie because, you know, it's not really correct by construction, it's safe by construction, um, but it had a nice ring to it. So the magical combination of isolation, security capabilities, and message passing was actually, um, really powerful, actually. And you see this in Erlang and other, you know, even some, some programming models that you don't even need to, you know, change the language, like Akka, for example. Um, it really, you know, most of the system was massively parallel because of this alone. Uh, our, our web browser, for example, you would fire up a single page and it, you know, behind the scenes was spawning 32 processes. And so uh, a lot of those things were exposing latent parallelism and were able to take advantage of it. And so that, that was actually really powerful. For a long time, we didn't even think we'd need data parallelism as a result until we started doing things like you know, decoders, encryption, uh, speech recognition. I mean, there were certainly areas where even with super cheap processes, uh, you still needed data parallelism to, to really get the, the maximal scaling that, because remember, we were trying to compare ourselves against what you could get with C++. And so you know, we were benchmarking continuously against the best workloads in C++. And so if somebody can introduce data races intentionally, if somebody can roll up their sleeves and you know, really hyper-optimize the thing, that's a pretty high bar to, to jump over. I'd say fail fast was actually wonderful. I think one of the funny stories I like to tell when we first ported the speech server to this model, it was in C++, uh, and it used H results. And it turns out, like all Taiwanese speech requests were failing with the same 
uh, error code, and the code just silently forgot to check the H result. And so some garbled answer would come back every single time. Now, I don't know what it says about the QA and validation that this wasn't caught before it got into production, but when it was ported to a fail fast model, boom, it just failed right away, you found it. It turns out, you know, we ran pretty aggressive uh, stress programs, you know, run, run one program and do as much as you can, you know, run multimedia stuff in the background with some web serving, with some, you know, random, just random things that compile going on in the background and see what fails. And it turns out we get to the point where most of the failures were actually integer overflows because we failed fast uh, on integer overflow. It's kind of annoying, but it actually pointed out like, hey, did you mean for this integer to overflow? Uh, in some cases, it's okay. You know, it's just a simple performance counter or something. Uh, but in many cases, that actually pointed out a bug in the system that for many other systems would have lain dormant for who knows how long, you know, years if not longer. Uh, and the result was performance parity with Linux and Windows. So we measured mostly uh, server-side benchmarks uh, like spec, web, uh, and some internal benchmarks, the speech recognition benchmark. <clears throat> a lot of client-side uh, benchmarks, though, like, you know, SunSpider and Octane and these sorts of things. But, you know, our goal wasn't really to beat the performance of a lot of these systems, although we ended up doing that largely because of the inherent concurrency in the process model. Um, but the fact that we even got close exceeded our expectations. I mean, we thought we would never get there. We thought this was going to be the thing that killed the project. Like, we'd never get to performance parity. And in the end, people really didn't care about the performance that much. It wasn't like a selling feature, and I don't think even a 10 or 20% performance hit, for some scenarios, would have been uh, catastrophic. I think people would have accepted the benefits that you get from the safety and the, the productivity. I would say the long-term productivity was great, but I'll return to this, and it was very interesting to see this morning that you know, productivity uh, is gonna be you know, a focus for, for the next couple of years, because I, th I think that's spot on. That's exactly what you need to focus on. Um, and when I say long-term productivity, I like to differentiate, because the long-term productivity was like, if you look over the course of the entire project, you know, we wrote five, seven million lines of code, something like that, with a team of 100 people, and we were constantly rewriting pieces of the system as we went, because we were learning as well. The system was built on itself, so it was fairly complicated. Um, but for a team of 100, you know, we basically built, you know, editors, web browsers, compilers, uh, you know, a shell, uh, file system, networking stack, uh, basically everything that an oper operating system has, notepad, you know, everything from the bottom to the top with just, you know, 100 people. And doing that in C and C++, like, it just would not have happened. It really wouldn't have. But here's the things that didn't work, and I'm going to spend a lot more time on these. Um, <clears throat> it's short-term productivity. And what I mean by that is, like, how quickly can I just write a piece of code and see what it does? It turns out that was a constant struggle for us. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment. And people are generally unwilling to give up Productivity now for a gain later on. Maybe, maybe this is just a thing in like the United States or something. Everybody wants instant gratification. I want to see it now. But the reality is, um, you know, the, the business, you know, business happens at a breakneck pace nowadays. You know, startups are coming and going all the time. It's, you know, it really is innovation happens a lot faster. And so anything that seems like it's an impediment to succeeding at that, which frankly is the thing that my, you know, CEO or whatever is going to reward me for, like. That's a difficult equation for a lot of people uh, to work through. <clears throat> people, as I mentioned, you know, really convincing people that, hey, yeah, you can write safe systems code. Uh, safety is possible. Like, you don't need to use C and C++. You know, you can actually get a lot of benefits from using this thing. It, it's just a lot of people are stuck in their, in their ways. Um, and it's, it's a new concept for a lot of people. Like, if, if you've been reading research papers for the last 20 years, 30 years, it's, it's not a new concept. Uh, but there's a lot of sort of bias that people have against even the word safety, uh, which I was really astonished by. I would say another place that we really failed on was we really did try to boil the ocean. And partially, we didn't know like what were the pieces that we actually wanted to survive in the end. Uh, 
And so what we ended up with was something that didn't have any incremental adoption. Uh, yeah, we had some way of you know, doing C ABI stuff, and, and you could potentially use your own build system if you wanted, but really you had to buy into our whole thing end to end to get even the first little bit of benefit. And that, I think, was ultimately the most critical failure. So the type, type systems are wonderful. Like I said, you know, I've, I've been a huge Haskell fan for a long time. I actually worked with Simon Payton Jones on a lot of the type system stuff that we did in uh, the dialect of C Sharp. Um, we caught hundreds of bugs, if not thousands. I mean, you, ca you can't even quantify because you catch a bug simply by the program not compiling. So maybe it's even millions of bugs. <laughs> I don't know. It's a large number of bugs that we caught that never made them their way into the system. People take that for granted. Uh, there's not an easy way to quantify it, unfortunately. Um, and even the ones that did become bugs, because of defense in depth, the fact that you've got this belt and suspenders type and memory safety thing underneath you, it's, it's harder to break, you know, basically jailbreak the whole system. You can't, even if you find an exploit up here, well, it turns out you're gonna turn around and try to do something over there and that's gonna, you know, fail fast on you. So that defense in depth actually was um, very powerful as well. And using the type system, we actually used a lot of, um, we, we f used that to enable a bunch of pretty novel compiler optimizations. You know, it's interesting to see the, the const, you know, generic const evaluation conversations today. So like one of the nice things is because we had immutability in the type system and all statics were uh, guaranteed to be immutable, we could actually evaluate all statics at compile time. And so all these like giant tables that you have to build up that that costs you at runtime because you have to, well, in C Sharp at least, it basically it does double check locking to make sure that things are initialized and, and we could elide all of that. And it turns out that was you know, like 5% of the instructions throughout the entire system could be elided simply because we had guaranteed frozen immutable objects, which it turns out is much closer to sort of C++ in terms of you know, manual initialization uh, and const expert. <clears throat> and yet, Despite these wonderful things, people didn't love it all the time. I would say don't underestimate the syntactic, you know, a lot of people say, oh, syntax doesn't matter, what matters is, is, the, uh, is the, the concepts and the semantics, and it's true, but it's not, inter not, it's not the whole story. The syntax is the user interface for the, for the language. And so if the syntax is, you know, scary, foreign, whatever, that's just gonna be yet another adoption blocker, yet another barrier for people to overcome. And I would say some of the syntax we had, especially around borrowing, uh, you know, one of the interesting things I looked at in C Sharp is C Sharp ended up with this ultra simplistic model, and similar to Java, just because they wanted to save, you know, you having to put a star character, right? They, they don't differentiate between values and ref pointers to values uh, or pointers to objects. And that actually turns out to be one of the critical problems that we tried to solve in C Sharp. Uh, but that is actually where most of the syntactic challenges came from. And it's not just syntax, like I said, it's really the model as well. But the syntax, you know, people look at it and say, whoa, this is bizarre. What does this mean? Um, rigor is not what people want when they are prototyping. Uh, I talked about this earlier. In fact, um, the type system it's not just the rigor, it's also, you know, oh, I wrote this very simple code and I got this wonky error message, I have no idea what it means. The type system isn't mapping to my mental model of this problem at all. Uh, what do I do? Well, a lot of that you can solve with uh, better error messages. So I know the mirror stuff uh, that came in last year, I guess it would have been, made the borrow checker able to give out much more diagnosable error messages, which is a fantastic uh, thing, but, you know, if there's any places where the type system doesn't match the human's mental model, it's gonna be constant friction. And we, we ran into this all the time. And it led to a feeling, people would say, hey, I feel like I'm just fighting the compiler. Uh, I just wanna get this thing working. I just wanna see what it, what it does. And, you know, or, uh, and, and they just spend all their time, you know, tracing error, uh, tracking down error messages, trying to figure out what's going on, rewriting the code in weird ways, contorting themselves. And so that, that was a problem. And I, I can't say that we ever really cracked that. Um, and even great IDEs and tooling wasn't enough. And so I think the core problem was, you know, certain 
developers just are accustomed to not even thinking about the memory management whatsoever. It's like this completely opaque thing that just happens, you know, like Python or, uh, and C Sharp is in that category. And so you could argue, hey, we started with the wrong language, but I feel like if you're gonna, as soon as you try to appeal to a much broader audience, this is going to be a fundamental problem. And I, d I don't have a great answer, um, but really paying attention to this and really getting to the essence, I think is, is critical. And like I said earlier, paying more upfront to save time later is, is a tough sell. This one surprised me. So reliability, security, even productivity didn't sell. And it's not that it didn't sell. Like, you know, you would think that uh, the chief executive of a company the size of Microsoft would care deeply about security, given that that's sort of the business that they're in. And I'm not saying they're, they don't care, but cranking up features, being more competitive in the marketplace, et cetera, et cetera, to the extent that security, productivity, reliability helps with that problem, yes, I think you'll get a lot of support. But when you try to go into a large organization, you know, you've got to sell the, the project, right? You've got to, or you, you can sort of go, go rogue and, and try to make it happen sort of as a grassroots thing. And that, I've seen that work quite a bit. But if you're trying to do something as large as like, hey, let's get support for replacing components in Windows with Rust or something like that, uh, I, I thought that there would be more support. You know, like um, obviously it's 2017, we should be writing systems code in a safe language if we can. But that's not the prevailing um, opinion, at least from my biased experiences. And one of the challenges we rarely ran into was this notion of systems programming. When we were trying to sell it to people, they were like, what is systems programming? It's this vague term. I don't know what a system is, but you go to Wikipedia, it's not, I mean, it helps a little bit. It says systems programming aims to produce software and software platforms which provide services to other software. Our performance constraint are both. So I guess that narrows it down a little bit. But especially today, with lots and lots of distributed systems, like a lot of code falls into this category. And I actually think that's a good thing. The only other thing I'd add is really correctness is paramount. Um, and unfortunately, often at the expense of productivity, which is a lengthy topic in and of itself. And your mileage might vary, but for us, systems turned out to be a terrible branding strategy. Um, it required constant you know, reiteration of the message. People would say, oh, but I'm doing application development, so you're telling me I can't use this. No, 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 you, you can, but it's just not for you. Like, it just set us up for a difficult conversation. And it's true, it's great for systems, but it was, you know, um, I, also, I also think the world is sort of, if you, Go is an interesting example where people are building systems, but they're able to get by with sort of garbage collection and maybe less rigor. And so you could argue like that's one language that works for both categories. And so the more you sort of bifurcate the target audience for a language, I feel like it's, it makes it a tougher sell. But in the end, I think inertia, is the biggest hurdle of all. I think you know, the most critical software on the planet has already been written by def definition, otherwise it wouldn't be mission critical today. And that's the software that's already picked a language. In many cases, it's gonna be C. Um, and convincing people to move away from that is, is quite difficult. So that's not to say we shouldn't try. So what is the future? Well, I think all of us have sort of seen a slice of the future. I really do. I think when I go talk with folks like deep in the bowels of Windows and talk to them about the problems that they're struggling with, and um, you know, I think Microsoft's getting better about seeing outside of the holes of that, you know, those buildings. I think you know, if you go talk to Linux contributors, they probably have a better awareness of what's available in the ecosystem compared to you know, uh, Windows engineers. But I think neither category has really lived and breathed the experience of writing a very fundamental systems uh, component that really demands the highest performance, reliability, security, you name it. They haven't lived through the experience of actually writing that code in Rust or you know, insert favorite contender for the new systems programming language of the future here. And the question is how do we get them to see the value? I think for me, living through the experience made me a believer. But the question is, how do, you, how do you get people to become believers when they haven't actually done it themselves? I think one way is really lowering the barrier to entry and making it super easy to experiment and, and play around with this stuff. Uh, but there are other things, too. 
This, <laughs> I borrowed this from uh, Simon Peyton Jones. Um, I think it's beautiful. It basically tells the story of what happened to our language. Um, clearly not Rust, but this is, um, this is what you want to avoid, you know, the, like, hey, you appeal to the geeks, but not the practitioners, and then over time, you know, people just slowly forget about it. I would say our death was a little bit faster than, than this, but uh, it happened almost overnight. <laughs> um, so how do we avoid that? Well, the good news is there's systems everywhere. Uh, based on my definition earlier, you know, operating system kernel, device drivers, browsers, distributed systems, which I'll, t I'll uh, return to, databases, you can go on and on. Uh, and all of these are systems that really should be using a safe language. I think there are more systems being built today than ever before. I think the, the trends to do more distributed programming means like you know, Kubernetes is clearly a system. Uh, Linkerd is clearly a system. There are a lot of these systems components. And the nice thing is people are writing lots of new code here as well. And so certainly looking for areas where people are creating new things, I think that's a, a very good recipe for, for starting to sort of take over the entire uh, space and make it the, the default answer for people in that space. Unfortunately, there is no silver bullet. Uh, I wish there was, but I think it's some combination of doing big, bold, new things, patience and hard work, and being in the right place at the right time. Um, and those three things, over the long run, I think put you in a good position. So this is a good example of big, bold, new work. I think Redox is a, a great uh, shining example of really innovating and using Rust to change the world in a, in a big way. But I think in addition to those things, incrementality is absolutely essential. Uh, and this is something I think I learned from my experience uh, in the project. You know, we did not foster an incremental solution. And every step of the way, that was one of the major things that prevented people from betting on us. You know, you want to make it easy for folks to bet on Rust or whatever component that you're building for a very targeted um, solution, uh, and then allow it to sort of grow from there, right? This whole, like, swallow the whole thing at once uh, value proposition is a very tough sell. In fact, many large ecosystems just can't be replaced all at once. Like, imagine, you know, Linux and GNU, okay? You can't just rewrite the whole world all at once. It has to be an incremental path. It's certainly easier to write new code, and that's one of the traps that we fell into. It's not only easier, it's a lot more fun. You can just go write lots of code and do great things. Uh, and then, you know, especially today, with such a vibrant open source ecosystem, that, that approach works better today than ever before. But really, to get at the heart of the issue um, and you know, get some of these mission-critical systems on, on the right path, it's going to require getting messy and getting into the, the existing C code bases and really trying to turn them on their heads. Um, and eventually the disruption comes, but you can hardly ever predict when that's going to be. Um, so one possibility, this is just a thought exercise. You know, if I, if I were to not be doing my startup, this is probably something I'd be working on, which is, you know, take GNU and the Linux ecosystem and start rewriting components, maintaining as much compatibility as possible. Uh, so take something like this and really, you know, use a C ABI as sort of the outer shell and really start replacing the guts of these components one, one at a time. And you do this over a long enough period of time, next thing you know, one of the most important pieces of software on the planet, Linux, becomes safe. And then eventually you can get rid of the C ABI and life is beautiful. I sort of liken this to a Skittles analogy, except that it's like an inside out Skittle. It's not, the exterior isn't hard, it, the exterior is soft. The inner core is hard. I think also, you know, finding a wave to ride or making a new one is also a super successful strategy. I think it's largely by accident, I think, but, you know, it's partially Go's heritage as well. But I see, you know, the correlation of Go plus Docker plus Kubernetes, like this whole ecosystem of, um, you know, cloud native components really picks Go by default. And largely, I think, you know, it's, it's part of the culture. It's part of, you know, there's this, they've got a cute logo. Uh, <laughs> but, 
I actually use Go uh, for a lot of the stuff at my new company. Uh, and it's, you know, especially if you're trying to build a new eco open source ecosystem, you want to sort of go with the flow, if you will. And I think, uh, you know, Docker and Kubernetes really set the precedent there. But I think finding that sort of an analogy, like what is the next big system or big important technology that's really going to take over the world and making sure that's written in Rust, I think that's a very compelling approach. Now, who knows, right? Like the Go team, as far as I know, didn't have much involvement in convincing you know, Solomon and Docker to write everything in Go. Um, so you sort of have to be in the right place at the right time, and there's a little bit of luck involved as well. But that also leads me to this notion of distributed systems where you know, new pieces are being written and swapped in and out. And really, that's, that's an opportunity where people are writing new code. They can pick up new technologies. They're willing to do that. There's an RPC boundary, and so there's not this messy, disgusting C interrupt stuff that you have to deal with. You don't have to worry about memory management on both sides, because if you have the C ABI as the shell, you have to worry about, oh, pointer came in, and now it's technically unsafe, but we pretend it's safe on the inside, and if somebody screws up, then the whole system's at risk. At least here, you have much stronger isolation boundaries. And I think this is one of the things with Midori that sort of made it work as well. The entire system was sort of a distributed system in a sense. All processes were sort of distributed, software-isolated processes and communicated using RPC. And the world is sort of going this way. So maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Linux is the wrong thing to focus on. Maybe the right thing to focus on is the fact that you know, there's this distributed operating system that's being created now out of uh, heterogeneous polyglot components. And maybe being a key player there is really the right long-term strategy. Uh, that very well could be the case. So returning to my original premise, I think in the future, all systems will be safe systems. The question is, you know, how long until we get there? And what's the path from here to there? But I'm pretty convinced that the people in this room and the community around you guys are in the best position to answer that question and really make that change happen. And so for that, I'm super excited. And I say, let's go build a safer future. So that's it.